Hello everyone, sorry about that. Um, APIs are great when you have one. And that's because things get harder when you need to scale from one to 100, 1,000 or 10,000 APIs. My name's David Yonan and I'm the founder of flowstep.com. I built Flowstep to change the way the world builds software. Flowstep is a collaborative framework for software development. It adopts an API and documentation first approach to defining requirements. Uh, the platform provides guide rails that enable staff, support agile processes, and complements existing design, documentation, and development tool sets. It automates many tasks and improves the quality of people's work. Flowstep makes building software with APIs easier, faster, and more enjoyable. I'm passionate about building software, and I strongly believe in these two things. First, you need to know what you're building. And second, using APIs as the common language for your requirements is essential. I'll share principles and practices that help shape the way you think about what you're building, and I'll show you how to get more people interested and involved in the design of APIs. These things also form the foundation upon which Flowstep has been built. This is the way. So how do you make APIs the common language? You need to make them relevant by adopting an API-first mindset. An API-first mindset requires a shift in the way businesses think about and deliver its data and services. Teams need to design APIs that can be consumed by internal and external stakeholders. They need to create API catalogs and API products that can be shared with different audiences. This is a story in four parts. To get started, we need to agree on a few things. It takes a team of people who are aligned and working together to build the best software. And building the best software is a process. This process should start with identifying a problem that the user has and end with an outcome that delights the user. APIs are central to this process because they provide the interactions that transmit the data and enable the outcome. APIs can be daunting when you're unfamiliar with the challenges uh, in building a successful program. These challenges go well beyond what's covered in Hello World examples and real world experience is invaluable. My talk is based on a career of work and many hard won uh, insights that are gained as a member of the Apogee customer success team. So why do you create APIs? People must understand why they're creating APIs. You need to educate people on how APIs can enable and empower businesses. Do you want to do better business by enabling connectivity within your business? Or do you want to do digital business by creating API products that can empower other businesses? The reality is you want to do both. And using APIs to do one will allow you to do the other. How do you define APIs? Does the experience define the technology? Or does the technology define the experience? There's no right or wrong answer because it will depend on the needs and the circumstances of the business. What is important is you, take, is you listen to the consumers of the API because the API will only stay as relevant as long as it satisfies the needs of the consumers. Now that we've established a foundation, we need to muster the troops. So what motivates people in, uh, across the business? Once we understand their motivations, we can figure out how to get them involved. For business, it's about winning. For product owners, they want to deliver value. Designers want to design cool things. Developers really want standards in the way things are done. And infra and ops people want to have confidence in the work that's being done. The business is responsible for ensuring that there is a business. It's a matter of win or die. Explain why, the business, explain why building the business on APIs is a competitive necessity. For each problem, an API is the solution. Demonstrate how APIs will add reusable value, enable the strategy of the business, improve security, increase agility, and reduce risk. These items are front of mind for many business stakeholders, and you want to show them that APIs can address these challenges with each new deliverable. It's a compelling proposition. Product owners care about the needs of the user, more so than any other group. They're measured by the value that they deliver to both the users and the business. Explain that every screen sequence and interaction of value is enabled by an API. Product owners and software, uh, the API product owners and software application product owners have different roles, responsibilities and considerations, but the success of one is dependent on the other. They need to be involved in the API design process to allow them to understand and influence the roadmap. This allows them to coordinate on when and how to deliver value. 
Designers want to de design cool things. Sometimes they do design unrealistic things. It's not because they're jerks, they just don't know what's feasible. You need to tell them that their designs are constrained by what the API does. Show them how APIs work, how they integrate into the overall design process. Explain how different properties, parameters and attributes can affect the way an API behaves in the data that it returns. Convince them to think about context as constraints as enablers. They often define the limits of what's feasible. Encourage designers to get involved in the design of APIs so they can influence what's feasible, which allows them to do cooler things. The next two groups are developers and infra and ops. They understand the tech and they'll probably be your biggest allies. Developers like requirements to be documented in standard format. They'll probably ask a lot of clarifying questions. And again, it's not because they're jerks, it's because, they can, it's because change is hard. It's important that each change in clarification is documented because it provides a developer with the context that allows them to focus on the design and their work. Developers use API as the contract between the business, the front end and the back end. Get developers to explain to other people how APIs provide a framework for standards and then get them involved in the design process. There might be more dumb questions up front for developers to handle, but it means that there's less change down the track. Ops and infra people want confidence in the way that they work. They don't say no, they don't like to say no, but they often have to. Again, it's not because they're jerks, they just don't want to have any services crash. Get them to explain how APIs, gateways and service meshes can help the company deploy with confidence. Encourage them to help people understand how services combine to make up the applications that they're running. Tell them that the more people that are able to understand how systems work will, uh, will eventuate in more realistic requests that come through. Given everything we know about software and how it's evolved in the last 30 years, we still suffer from flawed processes. So let me ask a question. When we're starting a project, why do we start with a blank page? There's no prompt structure or guidance. It's not like we, understand, we don't understand the constraints of the environment or the business. Yet we expect people to know where to work and how to start. We assume that they'll know, understand and follow the standards that have been implemented by other people. This doesn't make sense. In my experience, every, product should start, every project should start with the same set of questions. You've likely heard or asked these questions before and that's because they're important questions. What are we building and what value does it add? What does success look like and how, does we, how do we scale that success? What, do, what are the APIs that we need and what do they need to do? And it's important to recognise that at the start of a project, it's easy to assume but it's impossible to know. Do the services exi exist and are they fit for purpose? What is the data and where does it live? And the most difficult questions are probably the ones that relate to change because change is a constant. When we discuss requirements, we open a Word document or create a new Confluence site. When we think about data, we open spreadsheets and hopefully we've got columns that uh, des describe the different types of uh, properties. But I know developers who sometimes skip the documentation part and jump straight into building tables within the database with little to no context. I found that people in different roles will have their own set of preferred tools. And there are many great applications that solve challenging and specific problems, but they can often leave us with much, uh, another much larger problem. The only way to manage and uh, to identify and manage change in this type of environment is manually. I call this the observability nightmare. It's the fragmentation between these services that makes things fragile. And despite this fragmentation, it's fragile for another reason more than any other. People. The biggest challenge that companies face are not posed by competition, technology or regulation, it's the people challenge. Humans are the most amazing, inspiring and sometimes frustrating creatures in the world. People are emotional beings that are influenced by any number of factors and they're usually outside of your or their control. Despite the best intentions, people are rarely capable of working to their full potential for extended periods of time. And it's not because people are lazy, but things often get missed. We know how to work, and now it's time to learn how to work. We've established a philosophy that guides the development strategy. Now we need a framework to support the development activities. Building better software can be difficult. 
Context is king, and you want to know. Uh, you want to use the collective wisdom of your people, your clients, and the users. You want to explore problems and focus on people, with, but be mindful that the people that you're designing for may be developers who are building applications to connect systems, and not necessarily people. You want to find a way to embrace change because change is a given. Remember that agile and agility are different things. That's a whole different talk. And finally, you want to be structured in how you do things. You want to look for patterns that create repeatable models. That's the, that's the key to scaling. You want to establish a foundation that's built on good governance. Governance is a term that can mean different things to different people. I believe it's about creating a clear set of expectations for how people work, and that's supported by checks and measures that allow people to work with confidence. You need to think of it as freedom within a framework. You want to figure out which tools you use, but you need to be considerate of the observability nightmare. Some tools will be used to capture requirements. No one person will have all the answers. They're not even going to have all the questions. It's easier to make changes now than any other phase in the project. Discussion and collaboration are essential. There will be requirements captured in different formats and systems. Again, you need to be mindful of the observability nightmare. Other tools will be used to create documentation and other artifacts. These could be any number of different artifacts, which are again created in different formats and saved in different systems. Change is still possible, but it gets harder. And so begins the observability nightmare. You want to use context and constraint to refine the collective understanding. The deeper you get into the design and documentation process, the harder it becomes to track the detail. Conversations should consider all aspects of the business, technology, and the solution. Welcome to the observability nightmare. You need to collate requirements to refine the documentation. Understand how requirements, artwork, prototypes, API specifications, and UI components combine to build the applications. Change gets much harder, but while it's all still possible, it's much more prevalent. Use your best to actively manage this observability nightmare. You want to design process, formalize solutions, and identify the APIs to create the different artifacts. The best understanding will come from a set, a set of steps that describe the processes and contain all of the relevant information. You want to use this information to identify the actions and interactions that are required to complete the processes and deliver the outcomes. Change now is a major challenge. It's also no longer just the documentation that's changing. This is where things start to get missed. This is the observability nightmare. Now it's time to build the solution and minimize change. The only changes that should be approved are strategic ones, but that never happens. Welcome to the development nightmare. <laughs> so let's have a recap. First, we want to think API first. We want to solve the problem of the user. We want to understand the how and the why you want to know what motivates people so you can get them to buy in. You want to review your development processes and tool sets. And you want to be aware of the observability nightmare. Um, I've got a very short uh, couple of slides on Flowstep. Flowstep is a collaborative API first and documentation first framework for software development. It supports four core pillars around governance requirements, data, and APIs. It's a process oriented, which means it's analytic, repeatable, and scalable. And it provides observability across your business by proactively highlighting change. The way Flowstep works is you capture your requirements in the platform, and we can instantly create documentation, artifacts, and configurations, and then publish them in different to different destinations and formats. Um, I've got a very short video that will show how the platform works, uh, and I'll just uh, click play. So inside Flowstep, you have the ability to define your configuration settings, and you can get quite granular in the way that you do this. You can edit those settings and customize them to your preference. You can specify things like case conventions and URL paths and all those different things. You can specify how your versioning works. Once you've created that, we can then publish a set of API guidelines that are based on your preferences. You have the ability to define user flows, and these user flows are really a set of uh, functional requirements or a functional specification. It takes its cues from behavior-driven development 
if you think about a given when then given when then format, there is the ability to uh, add context, action, and outcomes. The action are usually defined by the outcomes. You can link to artwork, and if your artwork changes, the application will tell you that the artwork's changed. Again, we really want to manage that observability nightmare. As you're going through a flow, you can identify different APIs and the actions that are required, and you can create APIs, you can import APIs, or you can uh, define new APIs that are required. <clears throat> data central to uh, FlowStep, we have the ability to define data properties. So here you can see a email property. <clears throat> We have the ability to identify when data is PII or sensitive information. And then we also have the ability to understand where that property is used. We can make changes. And we can see that, again, when data becomes out of sync. When we think about the data models, data models are made up of data properties. Here you can see that we've made a small change and something is out of sync. If I come back to this email data property and I commit that change, so we'll go to version 8. Uh, here you can see that we're now updating the data property. We can save the property. We can do this on the request and response payloads. And then we can see that the, uh, the model has been updated. Now, because we have this graph of all these different related uh, act, uh, items, we can connect to them and update them. We also create a number of different artifacts. So we create mocks. Um, we've taken some components like uh, uh, that, we, that we build in Storybook, and we've pimped some of those components. We now have the ability to see when a component is uh, developed against a current or an old version of a data model. So again, we've got that layer of observability across our application. We define our properties, we automate the creation of things like documentation, UI validation, TypeScript types, and again, we have that reference, we have those references of where things are um, in or out of sync. Changing these values is quite simple. Uh, we can just update and save the payloads. And then the last thing that we can do uh, once all of the, uh, the data properties are up to date is we can publish these documentation and artifacts to different sources. Obviously, FlowStep creates API specifications. You can see some of the errors uh, that we've uh, made some of the changes. Uh, we have the ability to publish to different sources, like I said. So here you can see there's some text. We do a refresh. And then the, the text has been updated automatically. We don't need people to be, uh, uh, we don't need people to focus on uh, doing the work, just managing the requirements. The other thing that we have in the platform is the ability to create different dictionaries. Uh, and these dictionaries um, can be industry specific or company specific, but they help people understand things without having to go off and find uh, information. So in summary, you want to adopt API first. You want to understand the how and why of APIs. You want to solve the problem of the user motivate people to get buy-in, beware the observability nightmare, stop starting with a blank page and use a framework, and make APIs the common language. Uh, check out flowstep.com. There are free plans, launch plans, and free trials. Uh, I want to say a massive thank you to all of my advisors. Uh, they've been instrumental in helping me get to this stage, and uh, thank you very much.